So, my name is Matt Nolan and uh, I am from uh, Germany. It's a privilege for me to come here as a little fellow and I want to thank the community who made that possible. Um, I will briefly talk about uh, my CV and my early professional development, uh, more or less until the time when I uh, went out of grad school. And then I will talk about rapid urbanization and how it interacts with my later development and what I want to achieve uh, during my fellowship year. And it's symptomatic because uh, this is probably the empty slide. There should have been a photo, but uh, that shows me uh, as a little kid doing construction work in our parents' garden. And um, it's in a rural town and we are not very like um, exposed to international stuff. And, uh, and technology and none of my parents, cousins or aunts was able to uh, uh, scan the image and send it to me. <laughs> and, um, but uh, here I am and um, basically I kicked off my professional career as a bricklayer after high school. And after that I went into architecture school and uh, um, well we do not have the bachelor master system or not at the time but so when I would have graduated from my bachelor year basically um, I uh, uh, went one year uh, and worked in the Institute of Lightweight Construction and they had the challenging task in redeveloping and densifying this wonderful settlement here um, which is full of old trees including uh, two and three hundred year uh, old trees and uh, we needed to develop a master plan and one of the tricky issues was that the um, waste collection trucks they shouldn't move backwards anymore and so we should build a circular ring road through it and uh, that was actually um, quite messy and resulted in the move or would have resulted in the removal of trees and so we tried to limit um, the impact uh, by reducing the or keeping the building footprint as was it was and putting uh, uh, new structures on top that then would be um, also uh, paying for the elevator costs and thereby we would be able to Densify and upgrade uh, the settlement. Um, after that, I went to Latin America. It was my first international exposure outside, um, kind of outside of my uh, village, with a uh, few exceptions. And um, I uh, took classes in product design, and at the same time, I worked in, uh, in Rio's favelas, and uh, we went to buildings in order to map them out and find ways how to improve the energy efficiency. Uh, the um, Sponsor, sponsor of the project basically was the Lychee, it's the electricity company, and they wanted to reduce the, uh, the theft of electricity by improving the uh, energy efficiency of the building. But for us, of course, it had like a social uh, and environmental damage. Then I graduated with a master thesis, uh, urban design thesis, uh, not my uh, best one on, on uh, the Harvard in Rio de Janeiro uh, and after graduate school I basically started to work as an architect, uh, urban designer, urban planner um, in, an, uh, in a private sector office. So this is a skyscraper that I co-designed mm -hmm. and it's built in, uh, in Dubai and uh, I think uh, well, for me it was fun to work on it. And um, this is a, a, what we call a compensation city. Uh, for uh, uh, Abu Dhabi and it was uh, uh, it's only a design study uh, it was intended to absorb like 300,000 500,000 people and as everything is kind of flowery there this is was like the, uh, the guideline given to us and um, it resulted in a kind of unsustainable um, project basically on the right uh, uh, bottom right corner you can see the traffic forecast and I think the uh, uh, transportation infrastructure would have cost uh, uh, something like five billion dollars already and actually it was intended for um, what you can see at the bottom left for uh, um, income uh, workers from uh, South Asia and, uh, and Africa mainly who would uh, then house in these kind of uh, yeah, in these uh, multi-bedroom uh, uh, units and the entire city had an additive structure and would mainly consist uh, of these, at least initially in the design and then suddenly we discovered we should also be mixing with something else. But I personally discovered this is not the way how I want to do uh, urban design and planning and so I thought I need to get a better understanding 
of urban development rather than planning issues, so about economics, uh, uh, political uh, uh, structures, administrative uh, uh, systems, and international uh, cooperation skills. And so I thought, how can I get it? And um, I applied like for hundreds of jobs and scholarships, and I was lucky I was admitted to two. And uh, consecutively, uh, first went uh, in a uh, program which is uh, done in cooperation with the foreign office in Germany, and they placed me into uh, the GIZ. It's the kind of the German USAID uh, project in Egypt. I will talk about that later <coughs> briefly. And seconded me also to the World Bank and UN Habitat. And later came to the Kennedy School and uh, studied mainly uh, urban or micro macroeconomic issues. Now, so these uh, uh, scholarships basically allowed for a twist in my career. And I, start, I had worked on rapid urbanization already, like in real slums or, um, you know, in the, um, in the compensation city for Abu Dhabi. But I wasn't, like, uh, aware of like, what it was and uh, what are the dynamics underlying the phenomenon. And so you can see different world regions urbanizing over time, and uh, the red and the brown line, uh, that's basically Asia and Africa. And uh, they are rapidly uh, urbanizing at the moment. Other areas like Latin America or the Middle East uh, have urbanized earlier, and Europe or the world. Sorry. Um, as uh, urbanized a long time ago. And here you can see the growth rates, and interestingly, uh, or remarkably, they are the average growth rates with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa nearly reaching 4% at the moment. That means an average, on average, the cities double in population every, um, roughly every 18 years. But of course, then there are some cities which are more attractive with growth rates of 6 or even 7%, which means they double the population in only, um, in only 10 years and they uh, quadruple or more within one generation. And so this is what it means for the world uh, uh, urban and rural population. You can see large increases in Africa and Asia and um, in most other uh, regions uh, uh, the rural population um, declines and the urban population increases not as significant. Okay, so uh, this is why actually uh, I'm interested to develop a pattern language for these rapidly urbanizing regions, but I can learn a lot from the other regions which have already urbanized. So why are cities urbanizing? They are basically it's for the attractiveness of the cities or the unattractiveness of rural life for multiple reasons like poverty or like, uh, uh, crisis of various conditions. But here you can see like cities, the more urbanized uh, a country uh, is, which is like the uh, left uh, the vertical axis, the more, um, the higher is the income, which is the horizontal axis on a logarithmic scale. And about 80% of the global GDP is uh, basically generated in cities, and they are therefore uh, an important means for poverty reduction because the growth is also uh, taking place there. On the other hand side, you know, 70% of the carbon emissions are also produced in cities. And when Asia will, uh, you know, like uh, Asia is expected to quadruple the energy consumption, uh, you know, within uh, 35 years. So, you know, like with the carbon emission uh, 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 curving that we all try, uh, this is quite an important area uh, to act. You know, it's not it. The pattern language, you know, whatever I develop. Um, and if it is ever implemented, that's another question. But it will uh, not necessarily reduce it, but it will relatively reduce it to an unstructured development. You can also see these are like cities at risks, and by the color you can see exposed to how many risks by 1970, and this is how it is by uh, 2025. You can increase, a, uh, you can see an increase in the number of cities and the uh, number of hazards that are exposed to. And so my starting point for the rapid urbanization pattern language, it's basically that the <coughs> increase in the urban population is as significant as the world's total population in 1950. And then when the population doubles, it's usually associated with a tripling in the land area of a city for multiple reasons, you know, time passes, income goes up, people consume more individual space, and then also in larger cities you need more commuting space. So these basically, come together. 
And if you do not do anything about planning this in a sustainable manner, uh, then the forecast by UN Habitat will become true and two million people will be living in slums by 2030. Here you can see an example of that. That's Agra in Ghana in 1985. And 15 years later, the city looks like that. And you can see at the bottom uh, right the population increase was below 3%, but the um, build up area increase was above 6% per year. <coughs> okay? So then there's the question what is an intelligent way of dealing with it, given that urbanization can be very fast and where it is the fastest, usually the government resources and the people's resources and capacities are the lowest? Okay? And so, and then for me, the starting point is basically Christopher Alexander's uh, 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 book, The Pattern Language, um, which basically was, a, uh, uh, was developed in conjunction of a competition in Peru, which tried to answer a, a, a similar question. And Solly Angel, who was a co-author as a student on this book, he is a, Lincoln, a fellow at the Lincoln Institute, and he um, basically looked at like how some cities have been urbanizing, and he discovered there is later on there's a shortage of arterial street. Uh, here, this is in Bangkok. Uh, I think you can they have a, a, an arterial street every four uh, kilometers, and that's definitely too low in order to put in uh, to put in sustainable infrastructure system. So he says, let's look at New York or Barcelona or Berlin. And you know these plan these cities had developed at the time uh, significant uh, expansion strategies for their growth. Okay, so and then he proposes this is the original city. This is a triple in the area and a ninefold increase, which may happen within 25 uh, years. He proposes to put in arterial dirt road grid, and you know which means just to secure the rights of ways and then develop the infrastructure incrementally but make sure that the space is there in order to put in the infrastructure, okay? And this is how it may look like in a real life, uh, in an abstraction, uh, rather than this abstraction. And, but who secures it? Who builds it? How is it financed? Uh, who develops it? Where will, will the poor people live? Where will the uh, infrastructure go? Where are the jobs, etc.? And for me, so there are two different areas. One is the land adjacent to the grid, and you can see here in Curitiba the a corridor along the BRTS where you have transit oriented development with very high densities and where the municipality gains a lot uh, from the upzoning and, uh, and the taxes collected there. This is a bus rapid transit system in Bogota. And you know, before, uh, you know, like uh, the Bogota system basically moves around 45,000 passengers per hour per direction. And that was only uh, possible with metro or train before. And the system uh, is uh, very simple in providing an express lanes or an articulated <coughs> exclusive lanes for buses. And it costs about only one tenth to one thirtieth of a metro. And so this can be a solution uh, for rapidly growing uh, low income countries. Okay? And so then we basically, in India, I worked with a team to develop like a manual how to do this. In, in India, people can have a look later. I think I'm running out of time. Okay, and so where the uh, main transportation hubs is, this is where the street vendors are. This is a project in Durban that I had the pleasure to evaluate for the Gates Foundation. And uh, what they did is they secured the market for informal street vendors, which serves about uh, half a million people every day, and it secured two to three thousand jobs an annual GDP of 200 million in purchasing power parity. And it is largely uh, improving public uh, uh, space through allocation of public resources benefiting the urban poor. It has improved public hygiene, uh, improved security, and a lot of material values by preserving the market. Um, okay, and then there's the space which is within the grid. And I'm talking about this now, so this is a slum upgrading project I worked in Egypt. You can see like how it is. We can learn a lot from the informality. There are ups and downs, like this is a, like a, a good picture, bad picture from the slum. And then we uh, formed community groups that were basically addressing uh, several issues there. And this is the official system. On the left you can see like the, um, uh, 
it was at the time of Mubarak, so he's elected and then top down appointed all the administrative system and then you have like local uh, in, in, in purple you have like the community bodies which are or, like the political bodies which are also elected bottom up but they are more or less meaningless and so everything in green is the project and so then we try to like uh, improve it further and to create interfaces between these different bodies okay this is another example uh, what happens within the grid and if you develop the infrastructure, there are differential land values. If you develop the infrastructure incrementally and the housing incrementally, you can cater to different uh, community groups, but they all live close together, but they have like a distinguished um, position within the system so that they, uh, um, so that the better of recognize uh, their status and the poorer of are not excluded in a, like, uh, in a harsher way. There are different options what to provide them. And, uh, these are options for the infrastructure. And so this is one quick project I want to show from Pakistan, after I'm nearly done. Uh, so this is like a, a, a peripheral land, an NGO which comes there, spells out the rules of the game. Uh, people who are interested can come to this reception area. They need to live in a small one-room apartment for one or two weeks, so no middle-income household would ever like, uh, undergo that stress. Uh, this is, they come with everything they have, they unpack. Then later after the reception area, they move on their private plot. They construct temporary shelter. Then they get assistance to build better shelter. After some time, they build quite some nice uh, uh, communities. The infrastructure stage, you can see over like eight years, it takes. Initially, water is provided with tankers. You, it, this is a comparison of health and education facilities. In green you see a slum, in red you see the Kuda Kibashti uh, project. The provision is much better. The costs are more or less the same. Mm -hmm. This is uh, uh, security. And this is the cost structure. Okay, and so this is how it looks after, I don't know, 10, uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. okay. so this is a similar situation I evaluated for the Gates Foundation project in Zimbabwe. And then there are underlying issues like land management systems need to make uh, uh, work so that they fit. Uh, property taxation and transaction needs to be made work so that they fit for the needs of the urban poor. You know, the uh, transaction costs are too high, no one, nobody will register. This is a case I also evaluated for the Gates Foundation for of the city of Buenos Aires and they basically subsidize uh, informal waste pickers and thereby they reduce the city's uh, uh, burden. Uh, financial burden and these are just you know like uh, I'm not able to sketch out like I have worked on like uh, 50 different projects in 30 countries over the last 10 years so um, this is just to give you an impression that there are like hard facts and then there are soft uh, facts which you need to get right and uh, mobilizing the community and also empowering cities are important uh, components which basically need to complement each other and for me, it's all about incremental steps. It's about evolution of a system over like, many years with initial uh, low, co low initial cost, and then you uh, make it better. And if you try to do everything at a time, you will screw up and not achieve everything, which is what's happening. And so this is what I hope to think about during my year, and I hope to make this other jump uh, in my uh, own personal development. There's no judgment implied whether or not this is better, but this is my evolution. Other people move exactly uh, in the opposite direction, maybe not to childhood, but... <laughs> <laughs>